Here we go. Oh, panic moment. Am I on mute? No, I'm not. Good. Okay. So I was trying to be a hero and not use the printouts, but there's just a lot going on and a lot to write out. So uh, I way prefer that we just kind of talk our way through it. Uh, now where, I brought those notes in here. Chapter seven notes, yeah. Okay, so I guess maybe we won't even need them. The fresh notes. Uh, so I had these all typed up. I had to move some things around and add some stuff, but um, so hopefully the order still makes sense. I'm just kind of sick of, of looking at it. Do you ever get that way when you're working on something? You're like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> it was fine before and now it's still fine. Uh, so hopefully it's fine. <laughs> it's like, I'm over it. Um, okay, so um, we're working our way through chapter seven. Last day we talked about the sampling distribution of X bar, right? And so, and we said, okay, well, it's gonna be centered on the same mean as for the whole population, right? But our spread is gonna be a lot less, right? In fact, it's gonna depend on our sample size. Uh, and we talked about the standard error is sigma over root n. And I've got that kind of over here. Right. On the right hand side. Uh, Okay, so there's a couple of other, um, some examples here. We also said that, okay, for this chapter, we're gonna assume that we know sigma, but we also talked about, well, that's kind of unreasonable. So later on, we're not gonna know sigma, right? The population standard deviation. And so kind of throughout these notes, I kind of point you in the direction of, okay, well, there's gonna be situations where you are pretending that you know the population mean, or the population standard deviation, sorry, uh, sigma, and then there's gonna be situations where you don't know sigma, right? And so it's gonna be our job to read these problems and figure out if we know sigma or not, right? In this chapter, we do know sigma, but let's just have a read so um, we won't do this problem because we have to keep going and we kind of talked about this last day, um, but the entrance exam for business schools of GMAT is known to have a mean score of 520 and a standard deviation of 120. Right? And then the GMAT was written by 100 students this year, and so then we can go through and we can find the sampling distribution of X bar, uh, which is just it has a normal distribution with a mean mu, which would be 520 in this case, right? and then a standard error of sigma over root n. Uh, and here, when it says, okay, well, the GMAT is no longer the mean score of 520 and a standard deviation of 120, what that's implying is that that 520 and, and 120 are from the population, right? So we're pretending that we know how this thing behaves all the time, right? And so here, I want you to just make a note to yourself that we're saying that we know sigma, so this would be a sigma known case, and we're saying that sigma is 120. On the other end, right, for later sections, it might say something like, okay, so 100 students wrote the test this year and the mean was this and the standard deviation was this, right? So then what we're saying just by the wording 
is we're saying, okay, well, that mean and the standard deviation came from just the sample, right? So then we don't know sigma anymore, right? Really important to remember that sigma is just the population standard deviation, right? So it depends on if it came from the population or from the sample. So for this section, of course, everything is just going to come from the population. So just kind of, um, I don't know, convince yourself. Um, so we said we can calculate probabilities. So moving on to page two, because this is a review from last day. Remember, I was kind of trying to not use the handouts and there we are. Uh, right, so then we said, okay, well, we can calculate probabilities using z-scores, right, where we just replace, right, z used to be x minus mu over sigma. Now we're saying, okay, we can replace the x with x bar, but then we have to replace sigma with sigma over root n because that's essentially the, the standard deviation of x bar, right? And so well, here we say, we're just gonna divide by the standard error of x bar. So here, can make a note that this is the standard error of x bar. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll post the solutions to examples one and two, because we kind of did them last day. We didn't do these examples last day, but it's good if you work through these and just kind of try your hand at finding probabilities for the means. Okay. Um, the central limit theorem in your textbook is section 7.4. And so here I'll just put, this is section 7.4 in your textbook. But it actually just kind of flows nicer if you have it just following. And we didn't even call it the central limit theorem, but we did talk about it where we said, okay, no matter what population I'm sampling from, right? And I've even got this fancy graphic that I made. Let's say that this is our population, right? So it doesn't look like a population, but we're assuming that this is the, the entire population, clearly skewed. Uh, I think it's got like a thousand data points or something, right? So if we're looking at something with this shape after a thousand data points, yeah, it's, we're going to have to say it's huge, right? Um, so we're sampling from this, I think, sample sizes of, I don't remember what we did. Oh, uh, a sample size of one, found the mean of one, not that exciting, right? So then as we increase our sample size, so then we put it back took a sample, a random sample of size two, found the mean of those guys, and then put it back, took a sample of three, found the mean of those guys. And so what happens is that the mean, uh, we say it's pretty volatile here for small sample sizes, but then after a certain number of, so after a large enough sample size, and that's what we talked about last day, that the mean of these guys starts to stabilize around the population mean, which we're able to calculate because we're pretending that we have the whole population. Right? And so, uh, so that's the behavior. So what we say here is that the mean, mean is volatile, and how do I, like that maybe. The mean is volatile. Oops. For small samples. So that's the reason that we need um, a large enough sample size. Oops. Oh, whatever. We said, okay, well, one of the assumptions that we're making is that our observations are independent of each other, right? Um, so there's no kind of linkage between observations. We have to have a, a sample size that's large enough 
typically we say 30. Uh, depending on the population that we're drawing from, right? If we're drawing from a normal distribution, then we can kind of, we can go for a smaller sample size and still assume the mean follows a normal distribution. If we're pulling from a really skewed distribution, right, like we did here on the side, then we need a larger sample before things start to even out, right? And so then we need a larger sample to try to compensate. So it depends on the population that you're drawing from. And so, and I've even got that there. So the population uh, distribution is not strongly skewed is one of the conditions, right? If it is strongly skewed, then you need a very large sample size, right? And so kind of, and if you can afford to have a huge sample, then we're pretty lenient on the population skew, right? It can look however you want and we can just pull a huge sample. <clears throat> okay. We'll say that was kind of, bless you. So quiet. Um, so we'll say that's kind of the review from last day. Yeah, what's this fancy table, you ask? Well, it'll come up. Don't you worry. All right. But it looks pretty good, right? I guess I should have one of my own. But anyways, um, got it memorized. Do not. Uh, we talked about we started talking about confidence intervals last day, right? And so, and we established the idea of confidence intervals and the fact that we actually use confidence intervals in a way all the time, right? And we talked about, okay, I'm gonna kind of estimate the length of this board, right? We understand that it has an actual length, right? That would be our population mean, let's say, right? I can guess what it is, that would be my sample mean. Right? That's what my best guess is for the length or for the population mean. So all of stats from here on out, the process that we're doing is we collect a sample, we calculate information from that sample, but we're trying to learn about the population, right? And so uh, this whole section on inference, that process of going from a sample to try to infer something about the population, that's inference. And we can do that for a lot of different things, right? We could do it for one mean, we could do it for the difference between two means, right? How, do the, how does the difference for these two population means behave, right? Uh, we can talk about proportions later on. There's so many things that we can talk about, right? But that process of where we collect data, we try to learn from that data and use it to infer something about the population. That's our goal, right? So that's statistics and that's, that's why we're here. And that's why you have to take this course, probably. Um, or maybe that's why you wanted to take this course. And I did not think that was what this course was about, you're saying. It is. Um, so we established last day that confidence intervals are going to be our estimate. And so I'm, I'm going to use the general terms, but then apply it to, um, to a confidence interval for the mean when we know sigma. But if you have a glance at your formula sheet, right, looks like we're going to build a lot of confidence intervals right, for the mean, for the uh, mean difference, for the difference in the means. I know they're not the same. Single proportions, the difference between two proportions, right? we can go on and on and on. In fact, we could build confidence intervals around the slope of a line, around the intercept, but it's not very interesting, uh, around the correlation. Right? We can build confidence intervals around anything that we've seen so far, uh, sort, of, sort of, involving a sample. Um, so the breakdown is that the margin of error is going to make up a critical value, which we talked about last day. We found uh, a Z star in our case. 
and the standard error of that estimate. Right? And so regardless of where we go, right, we're going to have some estimate. The critical value, which we'll talk about more in a little bit here, and then the standard error of this estimate. So if we're building it for the population mean, of course our estimate for the population mean is x bar, right? That's our best guess at what this thing might be. We decided our critical value, we're gonna call it z star. A critical value is usually denoted by just a star. So we'll have z stars later, we'll have t stars, if that's it. Um, and then sigma over root n, we know is the standard error of x bar, right? So that's the, uh, the layout that we've got there. Okay. Oh. Wow. 23 years in prison. Crazy. Um, even on the side here, later, we're still. Let's start using our new terminology, right? We're still doing inference for a one population mean, right? Uh, because we're still centering it on the sample mean. So we're still trying to learn about the population mean. But if we don't know sigma anymore, right, it's not that big of a leap to say, well, if I don't know sigma, then uh, how about I use the sample standard deviation sold? Right, and so that's when we use S over root n. But, like I said, we start pretending that we know sigma, even though it's not unreasonable. Um, but because we're also using an estimate for, for the standard deviation, we switch it to a T instead. Right, and so uh, we'll get to talking about T's, hold your horses, uh, in the next chapter, but that's kind of where we're headed, right? Nothing is different about it. Our interpretation is gonna be the same. Right? We'll talk about the interpretation today. Um, in fact, we use the same blurb over and over and over and over again. Okay? So what I do for this stuff is I'll use the same wording every single time, right? So in the beginning, what I want you to do when we're interpreting this stuff is just memorize exactly what I said, okay? I don't care that it doesn't make sense, just memorize it. If you say it enough times, you'll start to kind of say, oh, well, actually, I'm just writing down exactly what I did, right? Uh, that's not gonna be obvious right away, right? So I like to give you the, the kind of the statement that you're gonna use, and then eventually you'll say, oh, well, that's just, just what it is, uh, right? And so you'll see what I mean when we get to the interpretation. But um, same thing for hypothesis testing. If you flip to the next section, right, we'll do hypothesis testing. There's going to be a lot of word stuff going on, right? A lot of interpretation. Um, and the danger is that you interpret it incorrectly. That's bad, right? So just use my blurbs until they start to click. And then you can just keep using my blurbs, but they'll actually make sense. Um, maybe. All right, so here, I've kind of done a, a rundown of, um, of what all these components are, right? Z star is called a critical value. And here, da -da, I'm saying it's found in the T table. The t-table is that table that I just gave you. Um, you can look. It says t-distribution critical values is what it's called. Okay. I want you to ignore the whole middle section for a while until we get into the next chapter. Okay. If you go to the bottom, you'll see that there's a z-star line. Up at the top, you've got your confidence levels. So remember last day we worked through and we used the Z table to figure out what our Z star should be for a 95% confidence interval. We said, okay, well, it should be roughly two. Turns out it's 1.96. 
All right, but if you go to 95% up here and then go to find your Z star, it's just there. And so that's gonna be a lot easier. And so let's see here. Do I have this table, yes or no? Yes, I do. Okay, so it looks like this. Uh, we're not talking about the T distribution, so just kind of ignore the midsection, right? But we are gonna focus on the confidence levels. I would not ask you to find a confidence interval that's not here, right? The default is 95. Usually we can go to 90, 99, but that's, you know, those are our go-tos. So then you can trace it down to your Z star line down here. So those are your Z stars that you're gonna use. Oh, I wanted to do that instead. And so that's how we're gonna find our critical values, Z star in this case, and Z star, is the only thing that determines the width of our interval, right? Because once we've collected a sample, if we go back here, once we've collected our sample, our sample mean is just fixed, right? It's not gonna change. Um, sigma is fixed, right? Some population standard deviation is not going anywhere, it's not changing. Uh, and our N, once we've collected our sample is fixed. Right? And so the only thing that determines the, the width of this interval is your crit, uh, critical value. Okay. So, um, and then all things that we just know in the remaining blurbs. Sigma over root n is the standard error of x bar, and then the margin of error is z star times sigma over root n. Okay. Um, I've even got a little, wow, I really explained stuff, not this term, previous term. Uh, to find Z star for a confidence interval, we use the T table. First find the confidence level you want in the top row, then follow that column down to the bottom uh, Z star row to find your Z star. Right, so there it is. Um, Let's find the Z star for a 90% confidence interval. If we go back here to the table, so you've got your table. So if you start at 90%, that's here. Then do, 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 my Z star should be 1.645. Actually, one, oops, one point. Six, four, five. Z star for a 95% confidence interval, we actually found it last day, right? 1.960, but we can confirm it. It right? should be the one over 1.960. And if I'd been clever, I should have checked to see what the next one was we wanted. A 99% confidence interval. Oh yeah, a confidence interval will just abbreviate CI. I don't think I said that, but hopefully that was. CI is a confidence interval. A confidential informant. So for a 99% confidence interval, doo -doo -doo. 2.576, nice, 2.576. You're not gonna round these. If I'm handing, handing you precision, precision, you're not gonna round these and, and go nuts here. You're gonna keep all those decimals, right? So whenever you get something this precise from a table, you have to use it, right? So uh, same with the probabilities from the Z table. Okay. Um, okay, just for reference, the 90%, the 95%, the 99% is called a confidence level, 
right? So we've got a confidence interval and then we've got a confidence level. I think you'd be able to kind of tease that out if you read something at a confidence level of 90%, right? Um, but so these guys here are your confidence levels. And it even says so up at the top, right? The confidence level. So we talked about this last day too, right? So from the 68, 99.7 rule, pretty solid approximations. Um, we would expect our Z star for a 95% confidence interval to be two, right? But 1.96, I'm gonna say is pretty darn close to two, right? And so uh, it's just easier to think about that way. Okay, I'm a stickler for this stuff. When you're writing your interval, and if we think about kind of our, our fake confidence interval that we made last day, right? I said, okay, I'm gonna guess that this, uh, this board has a length of, I don't know, three meters plus minus uh, one meter. I'm not very confident, right? Uh, me making that bound wide means that I, I've, I'm not so sure, right? Um, my interval then, right, would be three meters minus a meter and plus a meter, right? And that's how we get this interval. And so how you're gonna write it is, for example, would be two comma four in round brackets, right? And so that's gonna be really important. I will take marks off if you don't write your interval that way. Even if you write, four comma two, that interval doesn't exist. You can't start at four and go forwards to two, right? So how you write them is gonna be really important. Uh, and that's just me being a stickler for notation, I know. Um, so you've got your lower bound and your upper bound. And I see quite a bit, at least for the first time that we uh, are doing confidence intervals, People just do one of the calculations, right? So three plus four and then they're done, or three plus one, let's say. That's the upper bound, right? But we need a lower bound too, because we need this interval. So just keep that in mind. Um, we've said, okay, well, 95% confidence intervals, that's our default. And so our default confidence interval is 95%. So when you go out into the real world, if you're doing 95% confidence intervals, then you're safe, right? Everything is, is fine, right? Because you can say, well, that's the default. Once you know more about what you're studying and, and kind of what you're talking about, then you can change your confidence interval, but the default is gonna be 95%. I'll always tell you what confidence level to use, so it's not something that you have to worry about, but um, the reason we use 95% is because it's not this trade-off between the confidence, right? So how confident we are in our results and also precision. If we think about, okay, uh, if I've collected a sample and I've, I've found my sample mean, and I wanna be 100% confident that this, my interval that I've built captures the population mean, because that's at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out some range that captures the population mean. Population mean is fixed and we don't know what it is. So we're just trying to, to trap it, right? Um, if I have to build a 100% confidence interval, I would have to make it so huge that it, it doesn't tell me anything, right? That would be like me saying, oh, the length of this board uh, is somewhere between zero and, um, and 50 meters. Like, okay, so I'm 100% confident in that that it's somewhere between zero and 50 meters. That doesn't tell us very much about what the actual length of the board is, 
right? And so that trade-off of 95% is, okay, then we're able to kind of get in pretty tight, right, depending on our standard error. Um, but also we can still be pretty confident, right? 95% confident is pretty good. So, um, Here's a little sneak preview. I guess I should have edited this out. Um, but it's okay. We can handle it. Later on in hypothesis testing, we're going to use what are called alpha levels. And so we don't know about them yet, right? But in hypothesis testing, we use what are called alpha levels. But notice, okay, if the default is 95% for confidence intervals, then the opposite of that would be 5%, right, or 0.05. And so there's that relationship there. Okay, spoiler alert. Confidence intervals, we build confidence intervals and we say we're 95% confident that the true mean is somewhere in here. Right? And so hypothesis testing, we do kind of the opposite and we assume that we know what the mean is and then there's a 5% chance that we're wrong. Right? So kind of the same thing. All right, here's our interpretation. You will always need to interpret a confidence interval. In fact, usually confidence interval questions are three or four marks. Half of those are gonna be the calculation. The other half will be the interpretation, right? So if you don't do the interpretation, you can only get half marks. How's that fair? It's a math course. It's not, it's a stats course. So that's why we're the, the evil of, of both sides. Math and languages. All right. So here's the blurb that I want you to just always, always, always use. And so, and it's not plagiarism. You're just stating a fact. It's okay. I'm not gonna. This this is what I want you to say. Okay, so we are, and then if you made a 95% confidence interval, you're 95% confident. You made a 90% confidence interval, of course, then you're 90% confident. So and we use the royal we. We are 95% confident that the interval from here to here, right, depending on what you calculate it, from two to four, for example, captures the population mean uh, length of the boards. Uh, right here, you just reword the question because the question will say construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean heights of uh, everyone at Okanagan College, right? That's the population mean heights of people at Okanagan College. And so you just reword the question as an answer, essentially. Okay. Um, like I said, we're gonna build confidence intervals for other things than just the simple one mean. Right? We're gonna look at the difference between two means. We're gonna move into proportions, but the interpretation is always gonna be the same, right? We might not be talking about the population uh, mean necessarily, right? but then you just kind of reword the question as an answer. And once we've done a few, then you'll start to pick up on the pattern uh, and we'll be safe. Okay, so. We ready for an example or what? Let's do it. All right. So we're going to make a confidence interval. So if we measure the DMS odor thresholds, so DMS, I guess, gives an off odor in wine. Um, of individual adults, the values follow the normal distribution with a mean of 25 micrograms per liter and a standard deviation, sigma equals seven micrograms per liter. First thing just kind of that you're gonna do is you're gonna highlight to yourself that, okay, I actually, I know sigma here. Right? Not because it's important for this section,
but it will be important on the test to be able to read a question and figure out if you know sigma or not, right? Because that's going to determine what, what formulas to use, right? And so here we're saying sigma is seven. So sigma is known. And this is probably one of the biggest issues that people have, right? How do I know if sigma is known or not, right? I have a standard deviation. How do I know if I know sigma or not? Um, you'll always have a standard deviation. It's gonna be, did it come from the population? Are we pretending to know the population standard deviation? Or is it something that we were just using from the sample, right? So once we kind of just keep that in mind as we keep going. We would like to know if wine tasters have a lower odor threshold than the general population, right? Are they able to pick up on these odors, uh, let's say faster than uh, us normies, unless we've got some, some sophisticated noses out there, not me. Um, anyways, uh, we suspect that they do, right? They're wine tasters, so they should you know, be able to pick up on this stuff or else they're frauds, all of them. Um, so we collect a random sample of odor thresholds for 30 wine tasters so that we can confirm our theory. So we find that their mean odor threshold is 21.5. So we've got a sample mean from a size 30 right, of 21.5, which we want to compare to our 25, right? Us normies we've got an odor threshold with a mean of 25. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the mean odor threshold of all wine tasters, right? Now our population is the wine tasters because that's where our sample came from, right? And so our sample mean is from wine tasters. So now we're trying to infer something for the population of the wine tasters. Right. So here we go. Uh, how do I, hmm, do I try to squeeze it in here? No, I'm going to insert a page here. Add a page. Okay. Let's see here. What example? Example four. So let's just highlight what we've been given. We've been given that mu is 25. We're not gonna need that for our confidence interval, but it's gonna be good for later on. Uh, we'll come back to this question. It's actually really hard to find good questions where we are pretending to know sigma. Sometimes I make it up, but, um, cause it's, it's never gonna happen, right? So that's why. So our sigma is seven, our X bar is our sample mean, which we found was 21.5. And our sample size, we said was 30. So we want a 95% confidence interval, want a 95% CI, So what I'll do is I'll say, well, then my Z star, right, must be 1.960 from the T table. From the T table. Right. If it's in light blue, then you don't have to have it in as part of your answer. I'm just kind of guiding you. So these are all the things that we know and need right? because now we can construct our confidence interval and our confidence interval, it's on your formula sheet, right? But it's X bar plus minus, right? So we're gonna go down a little, up a little and Z star times sigma over root N. 
now we plug and chug, right? And so we get 21.5 plus minus 1.960 times sigma, which is seven over the square root of 30. Seven divided by the square root of 30, but try not to add brackets everywhere. There we go. Uh, times 1.96, 21.5 plus minus 2.50491783. What does this tell us? This tells us that the margin of error is 2.50491783. Can't stop, won't stop. So, um, roughly two and a half. That doesn't really tell us anything, right? But that's the plus minus a meter or 10 centimeters, right, that we were talking about, right? So that's our margin of error. And so now if we build our interval, right, I'm gonna go down that amount and up that amount. And oh shoot, I've been meaning to figure out how to store stuff in here. Eh. This is the time to be able to store stuff in your calculator. I'll have to YouTube it uh, on my calculator. But definitely your calculator will likely be able to store values. So then what I want you to do is just store that value. And then you can go 21.5 minus that amount and then 21.5 plus that amount. Oh, now I don't even have it in here. 21.5 minus 2.50491783. So on the minus end, so how we're gonna write this, right, is round bracket, the lower bound, so that's why I calculate that first. So round bracket, and my lower bound is 18.995083. Up to 21.5 plus 2.50491783. Oops, one seven eight three. Up to 24.00491783. Roughly, right, if we go to, oh, one decimal place won't make a difference, right? Because it's going to round to whole numbers, right? But here, or we can go to um, 19.0 to 24.0, rounding to one decimal place. 18.995. Mm -hmm. or just no decimal places but in this case I don't know doesn't matter um I'll tell you how many decimal places to round to I'll tell you um okay that's half the marks right the other half of the marks are in the interpretation of this thing Right. Remember, we made a 95% confidence interval. And so what we say is that we are 95% confident that the interval, that the interval from 19 to 24, and you can put units in there if you want. It's not something that I'm going to look for. I think it's like, I can't remember what it was. Um, micrograms per liter? No, thanks. Um, 19 to 24. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's too big. Uh, or too small, I should say. <laughs> too small. <laughs> and I guess it gets confusing because micro isn't that mu. Confusing. 
No, just ignore the units. Uh, we're 95% confident that the interval from 19 to 24 does what? Captures the population mean odor threshold for wine tasters, right? And if you go back to the question, I asked you to build a confidence interval for the mean odor threshold of all wine tasters, right? All wine tasters, that's the population. So we can be a little bit flexible there. In fact, uh, captures the mean odor threshold of all wine tasters. Let's just steal the wording exactly from the question. Captures, and that's gonna be kind of a, a key word, captures the mean odor threshold for all wine tasters. We use the word captures because um, we've collected our sample and as far as we know, our sample is good, right? But what could be happening is that our sample mean is really weird compared to the rest of the population of wine tasters. And so that's why we're only 95% confident. Um, but also just in your mind, I want you to remember that the population mean odor threshold is fixed. Right. It exists. It's something. We don't know what it is. We're trying to capture it. Right. We're trying to figure out what it is. So it's not moving around. Our confidence interval moves around based off of our sample. Right. And so because it's centered on our sample mean. So that's the important thing. Right. So there's the other half of your marks. I'll leave it to you to decide which part of this problem you like best. You'll have to do both still do the calculation and the interpretation. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Another thing that we can do is, uh, and when I worked for a, a market research firm, we had to do this quite a bit where we had to figure out, okay, well, roughly how big of a sample size should I have? Right. And so it's kind of a working backwards scenario where, OK, if I want my margin of error to be this size, right, if I want to be this precise around my sample mean, how big of a sample do I need? And so remember that the margin of error let's just say some people say MOE, I just say ME, is Z star times sigma over root N. In fact, maybe to match that formula inside there, let's just use lowercase m and margin of error equals M. I know, shouldn't go back and change stuff. I've written it. Everyone's busting out their whiteout. Um, so if we let the margin of error be a lowercase m, then we can write that m is z star times sigma over root n. If I want to solve for n here, right, what would I have to do? Well, if I'm solving for n, then I'm going to move my n over to the other side, right? And so I've got m times root n is z star times sigma. Solving for n, I'm going to divide both sides by m. Oof. And I'm not very good at those uh, alpha, bravo, whatever. What's that called? Mm. Is that what it's called? I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I digress. Anyways, uh, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I always make up words. Um, Z star times sigma over M as in margin of error. Nice. <laughs> Doesn't work for N, sample size. <laughs> so now, right, to shake that N out on, on its own, I have to square both sides. 
And so I get N is going to be Z star times sigma over. Oh, there. This formula is on your formula sheet, I uh, really hope. It's not that far fetched, but it is. Yeah, before I promise, promise the world. Um, so remember, we had a margin of error of 2.5 ish before. If I want to, so going on to example five, if we want to decrease our margin of error to plus minus two, right? So if I want to decrease it from 2.5 to two with a confidence level of nine point or 95%, so keeping that the same, then how many wine tasters will I need to sample? And remember that sigma is still seven, right? Still referring to that problem. So let's see here. I'll just put it down here. Example five, we've got N is Z star times sigma over M squared. Well, kind of was hoping I wouldn't need a new page. Okay, I'll cheat. I'm gonna write my equal sign across. Oh, you wouldn't. I'm doing it. I'm not happy about it. So Z star, right, is gonna be from my 95% confidence level, right? So if I had changed the confidence level, you would have to change your Z star. This case, it's staying the same. So now I'm just gonna use 1.960 again, times sigma, which is seven over, and then my desired margin of error is two now, and then I have to square it, so. I get 1.96 times seven divided by two, square that oh, uh, and multiply it by the answer. No, 1.96 times seven divided by two squared. I get equals 47.0596. When we're calculating sample sizes, it's gonna be really important that we, we understand that we cannot sample 0 0.0596 of a wine taster, right? That's, it's not gonna just, no, um, right? But we're also saying that I need 47.0596. 47 is not gonna cut it, right? Because remember how the sample size, if we increase our sample size, our margin, our standard error would decrease and thus our margin of error would also decrease, right? And so we need to go to 48 to get our margin of error down to two. It's gonna be a little bit less than two now, but that's a good thing, right? Because we want small margin of errors. And so we would need, need 48 wine tasters. And there is a note about that below the little blurb that we were working on here. So since we can't sample a portion of wine taste of a wine taster, we will need to round our answer up to the nearest whole value, regardless of the decimal, right? So here we had a really small decimal, but we still need to round up. And so always for sample size calculation, we always have to round up. So we always round up for, well, I guess solving for N. We always round up solving for N. Right, because we need whole values. Um, so of course, if I get you to do that, that's gonna be half a mark. Did you remember that you have to bump it up to a whole value? And did you remember that you have to round up? Always rounding up. Okay. Any questions about confidence intervals, finding sample sizes? And uh, 
just as a kind of a, a warning slash kind of um, hopefully keep you guys going. We're going to be doing all these things for just new types of problems, right? We're going to find confidence intervals, but especially for hypothesis testing, it will be overwhelming what we're about to do. But we're going to keep doing it and we're going to keep doing it and you will find that eventually you're going to be a pro. Okay? So just don't worry, we're going to stick with this. So it's worth kind of investing the time here and just establishing all the rules of hypothesis testing. There's a lot of ins and outs. Oh, well, we can't do this because of this and we can't do that and we have to do this. And so just um, what, I'm, what I've kind of resorted to doing is I introduce everything, we do an example, and then we just keep using it. It's not gonna... <laughs> It's not pretty. It's fun, but it's not, it's not pretty in the beginning. Okay. okay, you've been warned. Let's go. Hypothesis testing. Here we go. This is the money maker. Money maker for stats, money maker while you're while you're here, uh, money maker everywhere. Why we have to do it? Significance testing. So if I want to be able to make a claim. This, let's say I've produced a, uh, some sort of drug, right? Uh, this drug is significantly more effective than this other drug, right? The only way that I can say something like that is hypothesis testing, right? If I want to establish that there is a significant difference between two things, usually we talk about two things. We'll start with one thing compared to some number, right? Is there a significant difference in the odor thresholds for wine tasters compared to us normies? Right? Um, that could also be the difference between two things. Right? And so the idea, if we want to establish that, okay, there's a difference here, a significant difference between these two things, we have to do a hypothesis test. Right? And so uh, we're going to follow I do, I do four steps, I almost did this. I do four, four steps, I think the last one's on. Oh, well, on the next page, you've got it in front of mine, but mine's on the next page. Depending on what textbook you're reading, right, they might use, uh, I've seen up to seven steps. I feel like that's a lot of steps to memorize and, and just to kind of follow. I guess we could break it down to seven steps at the end of the day, we can boil it down to four steps, and so that's what I do. So, um, if you're if you're thinking back to your high school days, I'm pretty sure you had to do a science project of some sort where you had some hypothesis that you wanted to test. Right? My hypothesis is that there's uh, what was one that I did? I put Vaseline on little little cards around town. And then how many like dust particles and stuff, like how, uh, how much pollution and things there were kind of around town. I know, kind of cute project, right? Um, here's baby Emily. No, I, I was like in grade nine or something. Um, but yeah, anyway, so my hypothesis was that the bricks that I put around, uh, you know, the main street, would have more pollution than the ones kind of in back alleys and such. Turns out I was right. Didn't do any hypothesis testing though. Should have. They didn't teach us that yet. Uh, so we've got this kind of a research idea. I've got this idea of something might be going on here. I think this is what's happening, right? What we have to do is we have to collect data to figure out if that's true or not or if there's a significant amount of whatever we think is going on. Right? Hard to talk in vague terms, but anyways. Um, so the first thing we have to do is, you know, figure out what our research question is and state our null and alternative hypothesis. So at bare bones, we're stating our null and alternative hypothesis. Uh, step two, kind of vague, do the test, do the do. Um, 
doing the test for in the beginning here is going to be calculate a z score right figure out how far is this thing from what i hypothesize it might be at right? how far is the sample mean for the odor thresholds for wine tasters from the hypothesized mean of 25 if they're like everyone else so doing the test for us now means calculating a z score later it's going to be calculating a t in the same way. Step three, find the p-value. We haven't called them p-values, but p-values are just the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme than what you saw, right? And so if we've got a, an odor threshold of 21.5, something, what's the probability of seeing something more extreme than that from 25? Well, that's the area under the curve that's less than 21.5. So p-values will always be areas in the tail, right? Could be both tails, could be one tail, and we'll talk about that. But finding the p-value, we already know how to do, and that's why we spent so much time doing z-scores, finding areas under the curve. It's to lead us into being able to find p-values and understanding what p-values are. So then our last step, is of course to draw our, our conclusion, which easier said than done. Conclusion is going to have three parts, but anyways, there it is, kind of nice and um, and gentle. Okay. So that's hypothesis testing. Now we're going to do a deep dive into this thing. See how it works. Come with me, don't be scared. Okay. Um, what we said was we need to have our null and alternative hypothesis. There's a lot of new notation, right? And so we've got our H naught is our null hypothesis, right? H zero, H null, H whatever, H O if you want, although it doesn't really make sense, but because it's a zero, right? Um, the null hypothesis has to be the statement that there's nothing going on here. Right? There's nothing happening here. Everyone's the same. Right? All our odor thresholds are all the same, even if you're a wine taster. So here, we're going to be talking about the population mean. Right? I don't care about the sample. I know exactly what the sample looks like. I collected it. I can calculate things. I know what it looks like. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what the population mean might look like. So my hypothesis is always about the population. And then our null hypothesis is always going to have an equal sign. It's equal to some mu naught, where mu naught in this case is just going to be replaced with a number. Right, so uh, let's see here. I know I have these points down below, right? H naught is a statement of no difference or change, so H naught will always have an equal sign in it, right? Um, let's see here. How can I write this on here? This is always going to be a parameter. Parameter, right, is from the population, so it's a measurement from the population. And notice that these are statements, right? So that's why we have to have the colon here, because I'm stating that my null hypothesis is this, right? That mu equals this number. And so here, mu naught and mu naught have to be the same number, and mu and mu have to be the same. So once you've figured out your null hypothesis, right, then <laughs> If you're saying that mu is equal to 25, right, then you can jot down that your alternative hypothesis has to also be about mu, right? We can't do our testing on, um, oh, is there a difference between uh, wine tasters and us normies, right? We're going to assume that we all have the same odor threshold of 25, and then we conclude that it's less than, you know, 24 or something like that. That's weird. So we have to talk about the same things on both sides, right? Mu and mu, 
And then whatever number we pick to compare our mean to, that's the goal on the right hand side. So mu naught, mu naught is a number right, that we want to compare our sample mean to that we want to compare x bar to. Is it going to look better if I zoom out a little bit? Not great. Yeah. If we've got our null hypothesis, we're going to have an alternative hypothesis. Right? And so the alternative hypothesis is usually the one that you want to prove, right? The alternative hypothesis is usually the one that you suspect is going on. Um, that's some. How can I read this? I know. Um, the only difference here is that instead of an equal sign, I have a not equal to here. There's actually three options. Three. The default is not equal to. That's just saying, is there a difference between these two things? Right. Is there a difference in the mean odor thresholds of wine tasters and, and us normies? Right. Just We don't care which direction this difference is going in. If we want to get specific, right, um, then we've got options for the sign, right? We can use less than or greater than or, or just not equal to, right? And so the less than or greater than, then I'm only concerned with one, one, uh, one tail or one side, right? And so here, let's make a little note that less than or greater than, these are called one-tailed tests. In fact, I'm going to change my pen size here. One-tailed or one-sided tests. Because I only care about one extreme. And so here, this, we're just looking for a difference. Are these two things different from each other? So this is a two-tailed or two-sided test. Okay. And we'll talk more about um, oh, wow. Look at me go. It's even in the little margin here. Come on. So, um, this one tail, one sided, two sided test, right? I'll call them one sided, two sided. Uh, but if it makes more sense to you to think about the tails, then that's fine. That's not going to come into play. We're going to need that later uh, for our p-value, right? Which remember is step three. So we kind of parking lot that for a little bit, but it's good when you're setting up your null and alternative hypothesis because that's the first thing that you're doing, right? And so just to make a note to yourself, okay, I've got a one-sided test or I've got a two-sided test. Sit on that for a little bit and then we'll come back and need it later. Uh, but I do find that a lot of people have troubles, you know, you get to your p-value and you're saying, how am I supposed to know if I have a one or a two-sided test? And it all stems back to your alternative hypothesis. What sign did you use there? And the sign that you use is going to come from the problem that I give you, right? Is the mean odor threshold significantly less than the average population or just the rest of the population? If I want to test if it's significantly less than the overall population, then I've got a one-sided test, right? I, I only care about 21.5 being significantly less than 25, right? Not greater than, or not even different than 25, right? So, um, 
do the test. Still got time. Okay, great. I'm hoping to get through all these steps, but man, oh man. Um, so now our second step is going to be do the test, uh, which I know is really big. Um, but we want to know how far is our sample mean, x bar, from our hypothesized mean mu naught, right? How far is 21.5 from 25, for example? And then we have to take into account the standard error of x bar, which is just sigma over root n. And then, like I said later, when we don't know sigma anymore, then we swap it out with an s. But just like before in the confidence interval, instead of calculating a z star or finding a z star, we can calculate a t. Right? So if we're using s instead of sigma, then we have to use t's, puts us in the t table, but also in chapter uh, 8 or whatever. I can't remember. Um, right? And so we will get there pretty soon, once we've kind of laid all the groundwork for this stuff. Um, but notice that these two are, are essentially the same, right? So they're still calculating the same thing, right? How far apart are these two things taking into account the spread? Right? And so um, when we first started talking about Z scores, we said, okay, well, is that larger than plus minus two? We'll consider extreme, right? Here, that's going to be more, we're going to twist that a little bit and say, okay, if we've got a Z or a T even often, depending on your sample size, eh, um, if we've got a test statistic, because that's what these are, these are test statistics, test statistics, Zs and Ts. If we've got a test statistic that's larger than plus or minus two, we suspect that we're going to be um, that we have a significant result, right? which means later that we're going to reject H not in favor of HA, okay? that there is something going on. So for now, we're just going to talk about these test statistics. Uh, but the further away we are, right, the, the more standard errors we are away from the hypothesized mean the more unlikely it is that that's the mean for the group that I pulled these guys from. But that's up here. Okay. So, um, there's even a note here, right? The Z score tells us how many standard errors and observed X bars from the hypothesized mu naught. And then notice mu naught is the value from H naught. So it's just going to be a number. Um, we call the results from this step a test statistic. Turns out I don't need to do any writing at all. Got it all covered. Anyways, nice to highlight though. Okay, so once we calculate our Z and later our T, right, but for now we're just focusing on Zs, uh, then we find our p-value. The p-value is the probability, so the area under the curve, of observing something, so in this case we're talking about x bar, so observing an x bar, a sample mean, as extreme or more extreme than what you saw in your sample. Right? So you're just finding the area under the curve. Uh, so in most instances, unless we've kind of screwed up our hypothesis, but then we have to stick with it, I guess, uh, in most instances, the p-value will be there in the tail. For us, it will be. Unless I, I'm, you know, there's one question I think where I, I get you to think about you know, what the area should be, but anyways, not on the test though. Um, I've got kind of a warning, right? It's not completely accurate. But a nice way to think about the p-value is the pro as the probability that H naught is true, right? And so um, if we're finding that we've got a small p-value, which means we're far out into the tail, 
right, then the probability that the null hypothesis is true is very small, right? And so it helps to think about it that way. So, um, and then the p-value depends on the sign in the alternative hypothesis. Um, and this is where we bring in whether we have a one or two-sided test. And so here, part. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it'll come up. I repeat myself a lot. Uh, so um, so the, the p-value is the area in the tail, right? And so uh, if we're thinking about it as the probability that the null hypothesis is true, then if we get a small p-value, then that's evidence to reject H0, right? Because H0 is not likely true. And so how we decide what our p-value is going to be, it depends on our alternative hypothesis, right? If we want to show that the alternative hypothesis is that mu is less than 25, for example, then if we find a z as negative 2, right, then we've got this small p-value. So our p-value, if we want to show that it's less than and we find a value here, then the area in the tail, right, is the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme than what we saw, right? So as extreme or more extreme puts you in the tail, right? And so if we want less than, it's going to be this lower tail. If you go down to the next one, if we have mu is greater than 25, then hopefully we would have a sample mean that, that's on the upper end. So then we would have as extreme, so the probability of seeing something as extreme or more extreme, also the area in the tail, but on the upper end. And if you don't care which way it goes, then you've got a two-sided test, which just means our sample, we're only gonna have one sample mean. So it's gonna be in one of these tails. What we do is we find the area in one of the tails and then just multiply by two to get the two-sided p-value for a two-sided test. And I'm pretty sure I've got that here. Um, I'm sure it's on here, but I'll just make a note here. Find the one-sided p-value and multiply by two, multiply by two. And then that's your two-sided p-value. Okay. So, um, oh, it is here. It's the last point. For two-sided tests, our sample mean will only appear in one of the tails, but we will find the one-sided p-value and multiply it by two. That's exactly what I said. So I have a read through the rest of those notes so that we can wrap this thing up for the next day. Uh, oh, I guess I'll see you on either Friday or on Monday. Sayonara. Bye, guys. Thank you.